book of Joel, this is uh, part number two of the predicament of Petra. And the question that we're answering is this, if everybody, including Antichrist, knows that there's going to be a large contingent um, of remnant Jews in this area, why doesn't he just go down there and, and find them and uh, search and destroy mission and get it over with? And of course, uh, we went through some of the various things that are already on uh, the tape for part one. So we're not going to, uh, to go into those or delve into those. We're going to just start with part two. And uh, we're going to uh, take off then on the fact that when he comes into power, he does not have all the world's armies at his disposal. Uh, he begins to conquer and to conquer. He takes over the ten nation uh, European uh, Empire, which is um, the revived Roman Empire. And he has those and he begins to add nations. But he does not totally unite the world until the end of the tribulation period. So he doesn't have all these armies at his disposal. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that keeps him from uh, going down in there uh, to Petra is because of a shortness of manpower. Uh, and so uh, we need to see that he has to commit the greatest uh, bulk of his troops along the line from north to east and then back south again uh, to protect from oncoming armies. Now, here in Joel chapter uh, 3, verse number 1, you have to understand that Antichrist fights the armies of the world. He has to conquer them. Uh, and he does not do this for the greatest part of the seven-year tribulation period. Uh, and it says in verse number 1, of Joel 3, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So Israel is going to be in the land and uh, their capital will be Jerusalem. At this time, note, verse 2, I, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So God is in the process of gathering armies there. Now, why is this? Turn to Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. Antichrist is in power, but instead of controlling the world, he is only in control of part of the world. And you now are going to uh, see that God is going to begin the process of gathering these nations against him. Verse 8, therefore wait ye upon the me. This is Zephaniah 3, 8. Uh, that I rise up to pray, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I might assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire, uh, with the fire of my uh, jealousy. And so, oh, when we have Antichrist there, God is going to uh, have influence on the nations of the world, and they're going to begin to move on Antichrist. Now, another portion of Scripture that lets us know something very clear is in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. So when God begins this process of gathering all the nations, it's to gather them against Jerusalem. You say, what's wrong with this picture? Picture is this. If Antichrist has charge of all the armies of the world, why are they coming against Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is now his headquarters. Uh, and the answer to that is he doesn't have charge of all the armies of the world until the end of the tribulation period. So verse number two of Zechariah 14, 
for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city is uh, uh, going to go forth into captivity. At this point, verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So Antichrist has his hands full with some major armies, world superpowers, from the north, from the east, and from the south. Uh, it is the northern block, the south, the Pan-Arabic block, and then the oriental block of nations coming from the east. Now, we see this as we go back to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And note the very first part of this verse. It says, and at the time of the end, this brings us through the seven year period to the, to the remaining months of the tribulation. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The him there is a reference to Antichrist. So all of the Arabs that are united under uh, Egypt is going to uh, come up uh, and uh, they're going to begin the attack from the south. And I imagine that's Saudi Arabia, Libya, and uh, those uh, various uh, countries, Iran, uh, Iraq. Uh, and then uh, the second part of verse number 40. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, the king of the north in this particular reference is probably Syria with another group of, of nations that have banded together under uh, this particular leader. Uh, so you say, well, Pastor, what about Russia? Well, you'll remember that at the tribulation period, what starts the tribulation period, what brings Antichrist to the peace table uh, is to sign a, a peace pact, a covenant, to protect Israel from oncoming armies. And the armies are Gog and Magog, their satellite nations. And this is the first part of the tribulation period. All of them but one sixth are destroyed. So they have seven years to have to rebuild their army. We'll see them again in a moment, but they're going to have seven years to rebuild their army and then join together with the kings of the east. Now, how do we know this? Verse number 44. So you've got the king of the north, the king of the south. Tidings out of the east shall trouble him. And this is where you have all of those nations that uh, that are facing. Uh, um, uh, you you look at as you go from Jerusalem and look east. All of those nations: India, Mongolia, China, the Koreas, Taiwan, Japan, uh, uh, and all of those uh, particular nations are going to join together in in a, a force. And you talk about a mighty army. Uh, it is going to be a, a tremendous one. But note this. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Now, this is a reference to Russia, rebuilt Russia. And even now, China and Russia are buddying up. Uh, you know, they're, they're having uh, talks because, uh, after all, they still are superpowers and they still are communist nations, uh, the, the ones left on the earth. So you've got a king of the north and then another king, Gog and Magog, rebuilt and, and restructured by the end of the seven years. You've got the king of the south, which is the pan-Arabic bloc, and then all the kings of the east that are coming against Jerusalem, and they are coming against him. So however many men he has, he only has a few to give for this search and destroy uh, mission down there at, um, at Petra. Now, let's um, turn to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Now, God often takes the wise in their own craftiness, and uh, he is going to allow the dragon, which is Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet 
to be part of this gathering of the nations. And of course, the reason Antichrist uh, wants uh, them to, uh, to gather him is because uh, he does have some supernatural help. He does have Lucifer on his side. And so, verse number 13, it says, well, let's go to verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Uh, so everything is taken care of. God is going to make it easy for these kings of the east to come uh, toward Jerusalem. Now, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. God allows this to happen so that uh, he uh, can have these nations gathered toward Jerusalem. Uh, it says that the, they are spirits of devils working miracles, going forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them uh, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, let's note here um, a place where he gathers them. Because as we're going to note, these three places will let us know where the bulk of Antichrist soldiers are. Verse 16 says, And he gathers them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now Armageddon means the hill of Megiddo. And from the hill of Megiddo, you can look out for miles as you have the valley of Megiddo. It can house thousands upon thousands of soldiers. But Megiddo is to the north of uh, Jerusalem. And that will be his main encampment. That will be his military headquarters. But now, uh, we were just in Joel. Let's go back there to Joel chapter 3. And verse number nine, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up you mighty men. Uh, assemble yourselves, verse 11, all ye heathen, gather yourselves together round about. Verse 12, let the heathen be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There will I judge all the heathen round about. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. All right. Where is the Valley of Jehoshaphat? It is uh, part of the Jordan Rift Valley that is just east of uh, Jerusalem. So you come from Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, and that big valley and plain up there, and you begin sweeping around to the east of Jerusalem. Uh, it is the valley that's between Jerusalem, which is on a hill, and the Mount of Olives. So you go down and up. But it goes uh, for uh, for hundreds of miles uh, either direction. as. Uh, Pointed out, it's, a, it's about 200 miles where the uh, uh, blood is going to flow to the horse's bridle. And it is a natural trough like a wine press. And that's why it's called the wine press of Almighty God. He's going to tread on those soldiers and kill them. All right, now that brings us uh, uh, to Micah, book of Micah. We'll probably have to pack a little lunch here to. But it's just, just to the right of where we are, chapter 2. Micah chapter 2 and verse number 12. Now where, the, where is the southernmost point that Antichrist is going to have to station his, his uh, uh, troops? That is down toward Edom and Basra. I will, verse 12 of Micah 2, I will surely assemble, uh, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their uh, fold. Uh, and so Basra is where uh, the remnant is going to be gathered, but we also have verses that let us know that the, uh, that the um, uh, soldiers of Antichrist will be there. Uh, turn to Isaiah 34. And Stan, I've got just a little ring on this, um, on this one here. A little bit of a, a ring. Uh, Isaiah chapter 34. 
So here again we have God inviting the nations. Come near ye nations to hear. Hearken ye people. Let the earth hear all that is therein, the world and so forth. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, his fury upon all their armies. He's going to utterly destroy them. Now, where is this uh, going to be done? Megiddo, Jehoshaphat, and uh, to the east, Megiddo to the north, and then Basra and Edom to the south. Uh, note verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. Idumea is Edom, and Edom is the territory where Petra is located. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood at the great slaughter, last part of verse 6, in the land of Idumea. And it happens on the day of the Lord's vengeance, the battle of Armageddon. All right, chapter 63. of Isaiah 63 where the same thing is is stated who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra this that is glorious in his apparel traveling in his greatness mighty to save why are you red in your apparel because he has trodden the winepress alone, and he's uh, trampled down the soldiers in his anger, and it's stained his garments and raiment. Now, um, th this is uh, uh, in the territory, as verse number one says, Edom and Basra. So, Antichrist cannot uh, uh, deploy his troops uh, anywhere else. He has to have every uh, soldier available to the north, to the east, and to the south to keep these oncoming massive armies from taking Jerusalem from him. But in the process, of course, he, um, he does get them to uh, finally uh, join him. All right, let's, let's look at a couple other places here in uh, Isaiah chapter 16. And we're going to move on to our next point. And the next point is simply this. One of the reasons that Antichrist has to be very careful uh, in these uh, areas is because this area is a wilderness. And you will remember um, that whenever we deployed our soldiers over in Saudi Arabia, we had to have boatload upon boatload, barge upon barge of water and food and, and the like. And they had to drink gallons of water every day just to exist in that arid desert. Well, Antichrist troops are going to uh, be no different. Just because they've got the mark of the beast doesn't mean that they're not human beings subject to those limitations uh, and logistics. And uh, that's uh, another thing. These Jews, it's not like you've got uh, neighbors there that are going to be able to point to other neighbors and say they don't have the mark of the beast. It's a wilderness. Uh, and you've got to go find uh, these people. Uh, and uh, that takes effort. That takes work. That takes labor. Uh, so uh, it says here in verse 1, Send ye the lamb to the ruler uh, of the land from Selah, which again is another uh, word for Petra, uh, which is the wilderness. Uh, so Selah or Petra is a wilderness area. Now, as a matter of fact, this is again pointed out in Revelation chapter 12. The wilderness is as much a formidable enemy to Antichrist and his troops and an ally to the remnant in Petra as anything else. Verse number 6 of chapter 12 points out, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God. So, Specifically, God is sending them there because the wilderness provides uh, some means of, 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 of um, an obstacle, a detriment, and the like for Antichrist and his troops. Very same thing is said in verse number 14. Uh, to the woman she was given two uh, wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. So, 
Uh, when you're talking about how come Antichrist can't catch them, it's because he doesn't have enough soldiers. And even if he did uh, f flood the land, which we'll see he's going to try to do here uh, with soldiers, it's still quite a massive area uh, and um, an area where he has to tend to his uh, troops with a lot of supplies just to keep them alive uh, at th this time. All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Not only is it a wilderness, and as a matter of fact, God calls this a waste howling wilderness. Uh, it means that there's nothing there but the wind that blows the dust in, in the air. And it's dry land where everything is parched and burnt and uh, only a few um, by uh, oasis type settings. But the second thing with regard to this area that helps the remnant and hinders Antichrist is that this area is full of mountains. Verse number 16, where it says, Then let them which be in Judea, uh, and the capital city of Judea, of course, is Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. And verse 15 says, When they see the abomination of desolation. So on the day that Antichrist is set in the temple, they begin to make their journey down to the wilderness area one and the mountains. And we saw on some of these videos that some of the mountains in Israel, 3,000 feet high, but they're more or less rolling hills. But then you have the mountains down in this area that are 5,000 feet or greater. Uh, and it is such an area that, that people can hide uh, even from, from tanks, from helicopters, from airplanes, from soldiers. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not going to be there searching for them. It just means that these uh, uh, geographical uh, uh, things are going to uh, uh, be obstacles to them. All right. Now, something else. Let's go back to, uh, or here we are in Matthew 24. Let's go here first. And then we'll go back to Isaiah. Here in Matthew 24, verse number 26, we find other reasons why the soldiers of Antichrist cannot find the remnant. Now, they'll find some of them. Not all the remnant will make it. There'll be those of various ages. Uh, for one reason or another, they'll be stopped uh, along the, the trail. But the people who do make it, there is a specific place in mind or places that God has in mind for their protection. Now, we know this from verse number 26. Wherefore, if they shall say to you, behold, he is in the desert, the wilderness, don't go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Now, the secret chambers are rooms or caverns or buildings or houses that uh, all of the people that have dwelt uh, there uh, have dug out of the, of the rock in the mountains, and they lived there at one time. And you saw there are thousands of, of holes in those hillsides, and uh, there are some pretty large rooms there, as we'll see, where the remnant can go right in there and shut the door behind them, and, uh, and Antichrist and his soldiers will never know that they are there. Come back with me to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. And verse number 20. Note what it says. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut the door about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. So 
It's wilderness, but once they make it there, it's mountainous. Uh, you have to, you, you can't rock it into it. You can't shoot uh, uh, because of the thickness of, uh, of the stones there that are between the remnant and uh, the outside. Plus, you've got this uh, cavernous room where a lot of people are, and they just simply shut the door, and Antichrist cannot find them. It is a special place prepared of God that hides them during uh, this particular time. Uh, let's go to Psalms 31. Psalms 31. And verse number 7. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. Verse 8, and hast, not, and hast not shut me up unto the hand of the enemy. You have, however, set my feet in a large room. Now, the large room is a reference to the chamber with the door uh, and the secret chambers wherein the remnant of Israel will be hiding during this time, and Antichrist will not be able to find them. All right, let's, while we're here in Psalms, let's go to uh, chapter 23. Chapter 23. Now, I know that um, all of us have used Psalm 23 for devotions and for comfort and the like. But in actuality, this particular psalm has nothing whatsoever to do with those things at all. Psalms 23, the so-called shepherd psalm, the, the, the psalm of David, is a remnant psalm. That's what it is. The Lord is my shepherd. Here is the little flock, faithful remnant. And the question is asked, who will lead me to Edom? Who's going to lead the flock to Edom? It's, it's the Lord. God leads the, the flock to Edom to protect them there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Um, ring any bells. Take the mark of the beast. Uh, don't take the mark of the beast. You have nothing. Well, you are totally thrown uh, in a dependent situation upon God himself. You have, so it's a place prepared of God to feed them there and water them there for the, this uh, three and a half years of the tribulation. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. There is food and water in the secret chambers. He restores my soul. Verse 4. Now, if this is not a reference to the entrance of Petra, I don't know what is. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 300 to 500 foot high cliffs, anywhere from 30 foot across, and you go through this, uh, how, however long it is, from the outside of Petra to the inside of Petra. It's the valley of the, of the shadow of death. And they make their way through the sick. That's what it's talking about here. I will fear no evil. You're with me. And then he says this, verse number five. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, there they are in the rock. And all of these assemblies of armies are round about them. Uh, if they're found out, they're sure to die. They're sure to be killed. They need food, water, and protection, and they need somebody to set a table because they sure can't buy any food. And Psalms 23 is in actuality a shepherd psalm where the Lord leads them through the sick, the valley of the shadow of death, on into the rock and sets a table there. And, um, and all the, the soldiers of Antichrist have to shake their head. Where are they getting their food? Where are they getting their water? How are they existing? We can barely do it with all these supply trucks coming in and out, you know, and, and uh, being flown in to us. It's because God takes care of the remnant there. All right. Now, something else we need to, to see uh, as we come back to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 12.
and verse number 14. You remember a verse of scripture we just read where it says that the Lord is going to fight for Israel as he did in the day of battle. The day of battle is the exodus from Egypt. And so uh, as God rescued um, uh, Israel from the armies of Pharaoh, uh, and uh, from the, the rigors of the wilderness, providing them food and water there, he's going to do the very same thing for the remnant of, of faithful Jews. But it's interesting thing back in uh, Exodus 19. God said to them as they came out of Egypt and made their way through there that he um, put them or flew them, as it were, on eagle's wings. Though, and so he kept them ahead of the march, uh, uh, marching armies of Pharaoh. Uh, they were they were always one step ahead. They were always a little bit faster. They were all you know something held the Pharaoh's armies at bay. This kind of glory cloud, uh, so so that they could make their way through. Those are the eagle's wings, a, a swift journey, as it were. Uh, and uh, the eagle is uh, the, one of the largest birds, if not the largest, and it can carry a lot of weight. And that's the picture that he. He gives that he is the one helping these people stay ahead of the soldiers of Antichrist. And that's what it says here. Verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings as of a great eagle that she might fly to the wilderness unto her place. So God is performing some supernatural things on behalf of this remnant. He wants them preserved. And one of the reasons that he can do this is because Antichrist is not playing by the rules. Uh, and so if, if this is true and all is fair and, and love and war, uh, it, I'm not suggesting God is not playing by the rules, but this is something that he would um, uh, be allowed to do since Antichrist is, um, uh, as a compensation, since Antichrist is not uh, uh, playing fair. Now, let's look at a couple different uh, portions here, going back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. Now, here are verses you again have read devotionally when you're weary and all tuckered out and you, you, you know, um, things aren't going right and you come here and you read these verses. Have you not known, verse 28, the Lord is the everlasting God. There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Why? It's an arid a wilderness that that is a very rigorous journey from Jerusalem down there and even young people are going to need help uh, uh, and the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint uh, after all, there were prophets of God that were, were touched by angels uh, and or ate angels of food, and they ran alongside the horses for days and, uh, and had the, the strength to do so. God gives them eagle's wings. He gives them the fortitude, the strength to get them down there. So look at a couple other places in Psalms and then some other uh, verses in our concluding point. Psalms 57. Let's see where we want to read here. Uh, Psalms 57, 1. Be merciful, O God, unto, unto me, I will, um, I, my soul trust in you, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performs all these things. He shall send from heaven and save me uh, from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, Selah. Uh, for God shall send forth his mercy. So here you have the eagle's wings. First of all, as a means of transport. 
Secondly, as an analogy to power, renewed power for these people who are, uh, are hungry and thirsty and tired and hot uh, and uh, wishing it was, uh, was all over and about to, to give up. So you've got the uh, eagle's wings in that way. And then lastly, you have the eagle's wings of these people being under the very protection of God where he hides them under his own wings as eagles uh, to get them through this time. Okay, let's go back to Revelation and our last point. Now, this is somewhat a little more difficult to understand, but not so if you under, uh, uh, realize the symbolism here. What a flood is. Not a flood of water, but a flood of soldiers. And we'll prove that to you. Evidently, once Antichrist realizes, now here we are on the very day in the midst of, of the seven-year period where Satan is cast out of heaven, where Antichrist is crowned the Messiah, where the Jews begin fleeing. And you'll note that... Uh, the dragon here, verse number 13, saw that when he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, the, the, the remnant of the woman. So what did he do? Verse 15. The serpent cast out of his mouth. Uh, this is uh, Revelation 12. You mean I didn't, didn't give you that? Okay, well, hey. Uh... The serpent cast out of his mouth. And by the way, the last part of verse 14 says that she is hidden there from the face of the serpent. But the serpent comes down and cast out of his mouth. Now, the, the serpent here, the dragon, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, is a powerful angel. But he cannot hold enough water <laughs> to flood the ground there to cause any problem for the remnant of Israel. I guarantee you he can't do that. Well, what is this when he says a, a flood comes out of his mouth? He is dispatching soldiers there. We'll show you. He's given a command. Uh, uh, you knucklehead and a cry. Why? You, know, you need to get some soldiers down there. Poo! So he says, get down there and get the, the remnant. So out of his mouth comes water as a flood after the, the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. All right. Now, who um, is involved in the flood? Turn with me to Psalms 124. And just stay with me because we're going to be uh, trying to, to conclude this by going through all of these reference verses and then putting it together, and we're done. Okay, Psalms 124. The Lord had not been on our side. Now may Israel say, this is uh, verse 2. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. Now you see, the waters here are not a reference to water. They're a reference to a flood of men, an assembly of men, a whole lot of men. The stream had gone over our souls. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. All right, let's go from here then to the book of Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Note this, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, 
And it's not a reference to water. It is a reference to oncoming soldiers. And there are so many of hundreds of thousands, millions of soldiers that are in this area. Because when it finally, uh, all is said and done, he unites the, the kings of the north. He unites the kings of the east. He unites the kings of the south. And all the other countries he has as the, the ten nations revived Roman Empire. All of these soldiers are now united. And so the remnant is still in danger. Uh, and so they're, they're coming uh, after the remnant like a flood. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And then the Redeemer shall come to Zion. All right? Let's go to uh, the... We're in Isaiah. Let's go back to chapter 8. Back to chapter 8 in Isaiah. This will save us from going back and forth there to, um, to Daniel until we need to. Isaiah 8, verse number 7. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria. Now this is a, this is a portion of scripture that substantiates that soldiers are likened to a flood in the scriptures and that this is what happens. And he shall pass through Judah and he shall overflow and go over. All right. Book of Jeremiah chapter 46. Just have a few more here, and we'll conclude. Jeremiah chapter 46, and verse number 7. Who is this that cometh up as a flood? whose waters are moved as the rivers. Egypt rises like a flood. His waters are moved like... A, and this is talking about men. I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come ye horses uh, ye, and ye chariots, ye mighty men. For this is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Uh, and uh, his, his uh, sword is going to devour his enemies. Uh, chapter 47, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land and all that is therein, and them that dwell therein. So when we're talking about uh, the dragon coming down and casting out a flood from his mouth, it is him giving a command for a large contingent of soldiers to get down there uh, and to, um, to overrun uh, uh, the remnant and to overflow them. Now, what happens? We read there in Revelation that the earth opens up and swallows them. Come back to Numbers chapter 16. We're almost out of time, but... Numbers chapter 16. And we'll start reading with verse number 29. Now this is the rebellion of Korah and Moses is going to say, if the Lord's on my side, something new by way of judgment is going to happen. If these men die a common death of all men, verse 29, if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord makes a new thing, the earth opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that appertains to them. And it was a large clan, a large family. And they go quick down into the pit. Then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of his speech, that the ground clave asunder and was, that was under them. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all that appertained to them. And verse 33, and all that appertained to them, uh, they went down alive into the pit. So with all of these things considered... We now can understand how the remnant finally makes it to the secret chambers, how they close the doors behind them, and with all this other activity, both divine and satanic going on and human, uh, in the midst of it, they are protected. And um, 
After it's all over, the same shepherd that led them down to Edom will then lead them back into the land and start his kingdom with them. Any questions? <laughs> any any questions? <laughs> Reason I'm laughing, y'all look weary. I we traveled a well trying to get it so it'll fit on both sides of the tape. Yes, Miss Betty. Yes. Yep. And so we, we finally know then the answer to the question. Since everybody knows where they'll be. Oh, you know, there was another thing that I want <laughs> that I forgot. We're, we're going to go there. You, you, uh, you, Daniel. Oh my, this is the, this is key. This is key. How did I ever, my word. Daniel 11, one more thing. We still have time on the tape? Okay, well, good. Note verse number 41. He shall enter also the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape. It's in the Nifal uh, imperfect, uh, and it means it's passive, and it should be translated, these shall keep on slipping out of his hand.